and welcome tonight. Members of the House of Representatives condemn plots to install interim national government, ask security agencies to be on alert. Labour Party presidential candidate Peter B says he has never discussed or encouraged anyone to undermine the Nigerian state. And Inspector General of Police Asmana Kadi Baba receives framework for presidential roadmap on police reforms. On business news tonight, data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows foreign direct investment plunges by 33% to $468 million, the lowest level since 2017. And on sports news tonight, Chelsea and Liverpool settle for a goalless draw in a thrilling English Premier League clash at Stamford Bridge. From Abuja, the nation's capital, bandits kidnap eight students and other residents in Kachia local government area of Kaduna State. And in international news from London, the Finnish flag has been raised at NATO headquarters in Brussels to mark Russia's western neighbour becoming the 31st member of the Western Alliance. More reactions are still trading the alert by the Department of State Services over alleged plots by some persons to install an interim government in the country. The latest is coming from lawmakers and the House of Representatives who have condemned the plot. This follows a motion of urgent national importance raised by Honorable Nime Edem, drawing the attention of the House to the statement issued by the DSS. Our correspondent Terry Kumi has more. It's the first plenary session of the week in the House of Representatives. Days after the Department of State Security Service issued a warning of alleged plots to install an interim government in the country following the outcome of the presidential election, a member of the House is worried and does not believe that the threats should be taken lightly. Mr. Speaker, interim government is unknown to our laws. Interim government is undemocratic. Interim government is not something that we should support. Taking into consideration that our democracy is a young one. At this point, I think it is our duty to do everything within our strengths to support the current democracy that we are enjoying, to strive and then stay. His concerns are shared by all the lawmakers who condemn totally the idea of an interim government. Every participant in this democratic process must fight this because it will take us two and a half decades back. What do I mean by that? It's even speculative. Yes, it's speculative, it can be true. But how it will work, there could be a lot of bloodshed. We should ask our people back home to stop comments that are hurting, to stop comments that are destroying our polity. What are you writing for? Elections have been held. If there are infractions that you feel, go to court. The security agencies should... In further debate in the matter, one lawmaker berates the security agencies for failing to do their jobs, while another accuses former President Olusegun Obasanjo of culpability. Is it not a shame that the, that the security agents will come out and say they have the names of people that have muted this type of government in this country, you will not arrest them to prosecute them. You are wasting our precious time telling us to condemn it. The first attempt at suggesting this interim was by our erstwhile president, General Lucia Gwambasojo. In the letter he wrote to Mr. President, condemning this free and fair election of 2023 and asking Mr. President to find a way of counseling without going to court. While federal lawmakers condemn the calls for an interim government, they warn against heating the polity and advise aggrieved parties to await the outcome of litigation before the courts. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. In another development, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party in the 2023 presidential election, Mr. Peter Obi, says he has never discussed or encouraged anyone to undermine the Nigerian state. 
Mr Obi was reacting to allegations of treason allegedly levelled against him by the Minister of Information and Culture, al Hajjulai Mohammed, during his interview with some international media organisations in Washington, D.C., on the just-concluded 2023 elections. In a statement by his media team, Mr Obi says he is committed to due process and seeking redress in court. According to him, in the past few days, I have observed various campaigns of calumny directed at my person, with the latest being allegations attributed to the Information Minister, Lai Mohammed, from Washington, D.C. Mr. Obi adds that it is most unfortunate that these consistent efforts to portray him quite contrary to what he is and his core values are, is coming from such high quarters. Speaking further, the former governor of Anambra State says, those initiating these actions have increasingly used their official positions and agents to make false allegations against me. I am on record, as always, advocating for peace and issue-based campaign and never campaigned based on ethnicity or religion. He therefore urged those engaged in what he describes as the demarketing process to stop presenting Nigeria in such bad light. In the meantime, the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, says it was not responsible for leaking the audio of a telephone conversation between the presidential candidates of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, and the founder of the Living Faith Church Worldwide, Bishop David Oyedipo. The NCC's Director of Public Affairs, Ruben Morka, in a statement, distanced the commission from the leaked audio saying it was bound by the Nigerian Communications Act, NCA 2003, and therefore cannot track or leak telephone conversations to anyone. The NCC said it had been overwhelmed with inquiries by the media and was issuing the statement to set the record straight. The NCC noted that it had reported the allegations to the relevant security agencies for proper investigation and necessary action. The People's Democratic Party has continued its protests at the office of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in Port Harcourt, the River State capital. Today's demonstration is joined by more state assembly members, including its leader, Martin Zamirule, alongside the deputy speaker, Edison Ehie, and chairman of the Korea local government area, Samuel Wanosike, who led the protest yesterday. In addition to the demands for joint inspection of electoral uh, materials and issuance of certified two copies of resort sheets, the PDP is demanding the arrest of the APC governorship candidate, Tonya Cole. In 2019, recall it was the same Tonya Cole that shed innocent blood in Abonima. In Abonima. In Abonima. We mourn our brothers and sisters. He's not tired. He has come again yesterday and has killed one of us. Must Tony Cole always be known for killing? No. We go Graham? No. That is why from here we are moving straight to the corner of police. We have registered our petition yesterday. Today, after I neck will sleep in the corner police office, Tony Cole, who does not enjoy immunity, will be arrested and prosecuted. Yes, yes, yes. No, Mr. So. Who we'll sleep in Moscow Road. We'll For now, police must arrest him today. Cool. Yes. Because we don't know what to tell the family of the dead PDP supporter. Families the crying. wife and children are crying at the hospital. Why must we continue to fold our hands and allow criminals who stole our money because they are using dogs in arms? Nigerian police must rise on the occasion if they are, if they are impartial. We are ready to die yes. for our rights. Yes. We are ready to die yes. to yes. defend yes. our money. Yes. Enough. Yes. Enough is enough. Yes. Enough is enough. In the meantime, the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress in River State, Mr. Tonya Cole, is asking the Inspector General of Police to investigate the ruling People's Democratic Party in the state over alleged threat to his life. Speaking in Abuja shortly after submitting the petition at the force headquarters, Mr. Cole says the People's Democratic Party in River State is deliberately frustrating his attempt to obtain the certified true copies of some documents 
to enable him to pursue his petition at the governorship election petition tribunal. Mr. Kaur, who also visited the headquarters of INEC, also met with officials of the commission behind closed doors. Uh, this is with the aim of ensuring that the commission prevails on the River State Electoral Commission to release the documents needed by him. Our office at uh, the APC Secretariat in River State uh, was heavily attacked with uh, thugs that uh, represented the ruling party PDP coming with assault weapons and specifically saying that they should drag Tony Cole out so that they can kill him. And so based on that, the party in River State wrote a petition to the IG's office uh, that certain people uh, wanted to assassinate me. And so I went there to lodge a complaint personally that we cannot continue to uh, live in a society where politicians like me and candidates like me in opposition parties cannot just do their business freely. You would recall that what caused all of these fracas was to go to INEC office in uh, River State to just collect CTC documents. That's all. Just collect documents that belong to us. We had written from the 21st, a day after the declaration, had written for CTC documents to be presented to us. We were prevented from getting uh, those documents yesterday, and the information that we had was that PDP was going to prevent us from entering INEC office today, entering INEC office tomorrow, and entering INEC office on Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday, which meant that we will be out of time. So I came to uh, INEC office in Abuja to see whether we could get anything, uh, any progress from, 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 from the headquarters. The situation is that the headquarters is now on top of it. Well, still on that story, for the INEC resident electoral commissioner in River State, Mr. Johnson Sinikem, he has advised political parties to visit its local government offices for inspection of election materials where they are domiciled. He says this will enable the commission work out modalities for inspection of other documents at the state office due to available spaces. In a statement, the REC explains that parties had insisted that the huge volumes of documents like ballot papers be brought to the state office, which has been responsible for the chaos. He adds that nearly 50 applications have been made for certified true copies and access for inspection of election materials used during the elections, but maintains that such applications are governed by processes which is ongoing. to other stories. The senator-elect for Imo West Senatorial District, Mr. Osita Izunazo, believes the All Progressives Congress should zone the seat of the Senate presidency to the southeast, which it says deserves it for the sake of equity and fairness. He stated this while briefing State House correspondents after meeting with President Mahmoudou Buhari, where he informed the president of his interest to run for the position. The former federal lawmaker believes he is the most senior lawmaker from the southeast and south south in the 10th assembly our state house correspondent gloria mizuke also reports that the president received some governors the race for the leadership of the 10th senate is gathering momentum by the day as the senator elect for imo west senatorial district mr osita izunazo takes his interest to join the race to the president Mr. Izunaso, who had previously been elected into the House of Representatives as well as the Senate, believes he is the most senior senator from the Southeast and South South in the 10th Assembly. Beyond that, the former National Organizing Secretary of the All Progressives Congress wants the party to zone the Senate presidency to the Southeast. We will discuss the issues concerning the 9th, I mean the 10th Senate. It will discuss extensively. If I'm the oldest senator in both Southeast and South South, I think the question should be obvious. I'm the oldest. There is no senator today in APC of South East or South South that's older than me in the Senate. And that is an institution that believes in ranking. So I'm the highest ranking senator in both South East and South South. I came to the Senate in 2007. I was in the House of Reps. I've been in the party for five good solid years. I ran the party to the best of my ability as National Organ Secretary of this party that saw us a victory in 2015 and 2019. So I think we have paid our dues. 
Separately, the president also met with Governor Dabo Abiodun of Ogun State. The governor is in the state house to present his certificate of return to the president, who congratulated him for winning a second term in office. Governor May Malabuni of Yobe State also joins the list of visitors who have in the last few days presented their certificates of return to the president. The president also congratulated him for securing a second term in office. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umizuki, Channels Television News. In part two, after the break, bandits kidnap eight students and other residents in Kachia, local government area of Kaduna State. That's in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel Television. Here's a reminder of our top stories. Members of the House of Representatives condemn plots to install interim national government, ask security agencies to be on alert. Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Albi says he has never discussed or encouraged anyone to undermine the Nigerian state. Inspector General of Police Usman Akali Baba receives framework for presidential roadmap on police reforms. And former U.S. President Donald Trump pleads not guilty to 34 felony criminal charges during a court hearing in New York. And motorists who ply the Lagos Ibadan Expressway may have to endure the traffic situation a little more longer, going by the work plans of the federal government. The Federal Controller Works, Lagos, Umar Bakari, while responding to questions from stakeholders, says there's a deadline of May 2023 for the completion of the road. It goes on to say that the contractor has uh, been directed to work a bit longer while all traffic management systems activated to ease commuting. That sounds like the heart cry of those who ply this road regularly. Those who spend hours wading through traffic gridlock on the stretch and for others who bear the brunt of the tailbacks and don't seem to find answers to the question, is this the only option to this construction? Just as we keep tracking this situation to find answers, the heat has been turned on here as we see. Two Lagos state officials, the Commissioner for Transport and the Special Advisor Works to the state government have stormed the Office of the Federal Control of Works to demand answers. Because you don't want to panic. I know, I understand it, that time is, is what we're running after, May. But it's also good to be able to deliver this product, product to people without making everybody die. If there is an emergency, the rate of evacuation is almost, is impossible. Up to 2 a.m., my phones were still buzzing. What is happening? That's why the fact I'm not the commissioner for transport. Nobody can, if there, if there is ambulance or emergency services, nobody can move on that road. And it's almost like it tries in a week, it would occur. The point I'm trying to make right now is how can we assure negotiations that Okay, we'll put priority on OPEX, we'll open up OPEX, because OPEX, as long as OPEX is not open up, forget about what you're doing in Bega, whatever. As when there's a breakdown, the whole place will go haywire. How can you prioritize OPEX and get out of OPEX maybe within a week or two weeks, etc.? So we know that, okay, we're facing it, because that's the key point. And then move to beggar as well as toge that's what we want to understand Still stuck. what we hear from the controller sounds like if you want omelette then you must break an egg or better still quinine and malaria however he assures on a deadline within the lifespan of this administration we're targeting uh, completing the major work in may the only thing that can make it possible for us is for the contractor to to work if we don't do that now the, the project is going to um, extend to another year. There are two ways to it. 
we can do it in such a way that it will last a lot longer. And we can do it in such a way that it will take a very short time. The effect of the two are different. Back to the street, he heeds the call to pay official visits to the construction site scattered across seven kilometers between the old toll gate and Kara Bridge. In addition to setting up a special tax force comprising security and traffic agencies. A few actions have been notched to include extra work hours up till late evening. So we return late night to ascertain the traffic situation. Tadala area, Tadala Bridge area of the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, one of the uh, three, four points where Julius Berger is working. And it's, it's after 1 a.m. Um, and there is still traffic going to the narrow gauge on the side of the road. Just to bring you um, notice of what happens uh, throughout the day. So this is the night time and people are still in traffic. For now, commuters may just have to take one day at a time, at least for the next 50 days or more, before normalcy returns. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. I'm sure it's a bit easier in the nation's capital. We head over uh, to our studios there, where Gloria Mizuke is standing by with more. Hi, Gloria. Thank you, Millicent. Definitely, it's a lot easier. Here in Abuja, we begin in Kaduna State, where eight students and some residents of Awan in Kachia local government area have been kidnapped by bandits. The state government, which conformed, confirmed the incident after receiving detailed reports from security agencies, said in a statement that the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Aruan, explained that the students were not kidnapped within the school premises but on their way home from school when they came in contact with the bandits who had abducted other residents. He also disclosed that the management of the school has submitted the names and classes of the kidnapped students. Meanwhile, Governor Nasser El Rafai has condemned the abduction, describing it as unfortunate, and has received assurances of efforts being exploited to rescue the eight students and other kidnapped citizens. In another development, the Kaduna state government has relaxed the 24-hour curfew it imposed on Sabangiri Nasarawa community in Chikun local government area on Monday. The review, according to the commissioner, follows close monitoring and assessment of the situation by security agencies in the area. In Kaduna state, the police has arrested two persons in connection with the death of a 20-year-old pregnant woman found by the roadside in Anadaria village in Bibiji, local government area of the state, on March 28, 2023. According to a statement by the spokesperson of the Kano Command, SB Abdullahi Kiawa, on the receipt of the report, the Commissioner of Police, Maman Dauda, instructed a team of detectives led by the Divisional Police Officer of Bibiji Division, SB Tanimu Wada, to proceed to the scene. The police later identified the dead woman as Teresa Yakubu and her boyfriend, Philibos Ibrahim, as well as his friend, Gabriel Bila, who were thereafter arrested in connection with the murder. The police say Mr. Ibrahim reportedly confessed to the crime, saying he conspired with his friend to kill her after attempts to abort the pregnancy failed. The case has been transferred to the State Criminal Investigation Department, Homicide Division, for discreet investigation and the suspects will be charged to court upon completion of the investigation. A framework for the presidential roadmap on police reforms in Nigeria has been presented to the Inspector General of Police, Mr. Usman Al-Khali Baba, by the Police Reform and Transformation Office. The document developed in conjunction with the United Nations Development Programme aims at ensuring police accountability, promoting transparency and demilitarization of the police, among other objectives. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. The Inspector General of Police, Mr. Usman Al-Khalibaba, 
is here to meet officials from the Police Reform and Transformation Office portal and the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, for the official presentation of the framework for the presidential roadmap on police reforms, the Review Niger Police Act 2020, among other strategic communication materials. For years, the Niger Police has come under criticisms either for alleged corrupt practices or maltreatment of innocent citizens by its officers and men, a situation which gave rise to the NSAS protest in 2020, which saw the citizens demanding for the reform of the police. Nigeria police for strategic but the representatives of the UNDP and the Police Reform and Transformation Office believe that is about to change. These materials will be critical to improving the conduct and disposition of the police while maintaining professional conduct in relation with police, uh, with the public and fellow officers. We are hoping that uh, over the next incoming months, the transitionary months, that we'll continue our work and uh, in the fullness of this new administration, we'll now begin to see benefits of all the work that has been done in the past uh, two years. For the Inspector General of Police, Reforming the Niger police is top on his agenda. The best way to inculcate these new ideas in our personnel is to make it a subject of study, is to incorporate it in our curriculum of studies, in our training institutions, and also uh, for development courses, training the trainers, courses that every rank will adhere to. Also presented to the IGP is a document containing the standard operating procedures for investigation put together by the International Committee of Red Cross, ICRC, in partnership with the Rule of Law and Accountability, RULAC program, as well as the blueprint of a 500-bed field deployment base camp to be located in Maiduguri, the capital of Borno States. The reviewed Nigeria Police Act 2020 and these strategic communication materials are expected to enhance the activities of the Nigeria Police Force in ensuring adequate security of the citizens. From the force headquarters in Abuja, Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. As the energy transition process gets tough for gas-rich countries like Nigeria, the country must persist in its attempts to explore renewable fuels as its contribution to meeting the net zero emissions goal. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju, stated this as part of his speech at the official signing ceremony for definitive agreements of Carbon Vista, which was held at the lawn of the banquet hall of the State House in Abuja. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. Vice President Professor Yamio Shimbajo is leading the pack to the lawn of the banquet hall of the State House in Abuja. This is where the novel agreement, tagged Carbon Vista, will be signed. It is a $50 million joint venture between the Nigeria Social Investment Authority and Vitol, a Swiss-based Dutch multinational energy and commodity trading company which trades and distributes energy safely and responsibly around the world. The importance of doing this is simultaneously linked with climate change, the objectives of Nigeria for 2060, and the realization that in reality, growth, commercial growth, the benefit to the population, also have to take into consideration the transition. NSI and VTOL have committed an initial sum of $50 million to Carbon Vista for projects such as climate smart agriculture, green industrial technologies, waste management, water purification, clean cooking, etc. Opening up Nigeria's domestic carbon sector is crucial for Nigeria's development and opens up renewable energy options, which according to the Vice President, every responsible country in the world should be exploring to ensure the planet survives. If we're going to develop our industry for the rest of the world, we can start from where we are today. We do not have to start from where the, the rest of the world, has, uh, especially the global north, is at the moment. If we are the least emitters and we're able to use green energy effectively, we're able to use the young population that we have, 
were able to, man to, to, to effectively deploy green manufacturing on the scale that would require to become the global factory of the world, the global green factory of the world, and the global green power of the world. We can indeed do something that is revolutionary and different. The signing of this agreement has opened up a whole new market in Nigeria's domestic carbon and helped Nigeria keep to its many commitments, especially in the war against climate change. And as the vice president noted at today's event, fossil rich countries like Nigeria find themselves in a situation where they still need to use gas, but must explore other areas of renewable energy. And this agreement just helps the country do exactly that. From the Banquet Hall of State House in Abuja, Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Millicent. Thank you, Gloria. Well, we're back in River State, where Governor Yesun Wike is asking opposition political parties in the state to accept defeat and not challenge the outcome of the governorship election in the state. Governor Wike said the PDP won the elections convincingly because the people of the state are happy with the performance of the party. The governor stated this during the inauguration of a remodeled government secondary school in Gokana local government area performed by Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State. Although the political atmosphere in River State seems tense, the Yeson Wiki led administration appears determined to deliver more infrastructure in fulfillment of its campaign promises. The project in focus is the remodeled government secondary school ball in Gokana local government area. It was restructured from a few dilapidated blocks of classrooms to this multifunctional school building with furniture. Yes, let's say the project entails 18 buildings constructed and remodeled, including four support facilities, 300 seater assembly or multipurpose hall, well furnished with air conditions. Looking around here, you will see that the governor of River State is a man of quality, and that's why we call him Mr. Quality Project. This is just not, not just a project, but a quality project. And we in the Education Ministry, we are very proud and happy to say thank you, Your Excellency, for this wonderful gesture. Governor Samuel Otomo Benue State, a regular visitor to River State, is a special guest. He commends Governor Wiki for the project and also expresses his satisfaction on the outcome of the presidential election, despite losing his bid to the Senate. I've always said that show me the level of your education and I will tell you the level of your development. What you have done, posterity will ever remember you and write your name in gold on the sands of time. Governor Wike says the completion of the project attests to his administration honesty in fulfilling promises. He also comments on the political happenings in River State, urging his supporters not to panic as opposition parties are fighting a lost battle already. If politicians can fulfill promises made, this country would have been better off. It is not as if the money is not there. It is commitment. I'm happy the governor elect is here. Don't mind those who are wasting their time crying on television. Have you seen where a candidate will be going to have an exam want to go and collect CTC? Those are duties of lawyers. Can people see the truth of the matter? You lost the election, you lost the election. The project is then commissioned and inspected. <laughs> this facility is expected to stand the test of time as the council chairman promises to take the responsibility to secure it for the benefit of the people. Staying in the Niger Delta, the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited has commissioned an intensive care unit that it built and furnished as part of its hospital support program to the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospital, Okolobiri, in Bayelsa State. The NLNG hospital support program was conceived on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the intent is to lessen the envisage pressure that medical institutions would experience in managing patients if a pandemic erupts. This is the newly built intensive care unit at the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospital, Okulobiri, Bayelsa State. 
A look inside the complex reveals medical equipment meant to cater to the needs of ill patients, including beds, monitors, conference room, and offices for its medical staff. <laughs> Guests are gathered here for the commissioning of the complex. Yeah. And the CMD of NDUTH speaks on the facility. This ICU complex will provide specialist health services to all patients in need of critical life-saving care, independent of their department. So whether you're in medicine, you're in surgery, you're in obstetrics and gynecology, you're in ENT, it doesn't matter. So it's cross-cutting across all departments. According to the General Manager of Internal Relations and Sustainable Development, NLNG, the donation is part of their corporate social responsibility. Our commissioning today of an intensive care unit at the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospital, Biosa State, through the NLNG Hospital Support Program, is a further indication of that fact that will continue to help to build a better Nigeria. Is the project lead for the HSP, HSP, please. The project lead also spoke on the structure. The project was funded based on three milestones. That is, the com completion of each milestone and certification, the next milestone fund was paid without delay. The project was awarded to three different contractors that the structure is served to a different contractor, the medical equipment to furnishing to a different person, and the gas piping to another contractor. The permanent secretary of the Biosa State Ministry of Health expressed the gratitude of the state government to NLNG. It is a very, very important facility that has been provided. And everyone here that is a medical professional will agree with me that it is very important that I see you is um, available in any hospital, especially a tertiary hospital like um, NDU Teaching Hospital. The entourage then proceeds for the commissioning and touring of the complex. On January the 24th, 2022, the NLNG Limited signed a memorandum of understanding with 12 teaching hospitals across the six geopolitical zones and Abuja. This ICU complex at the NDUTH is a result of that MOU, which should serve its purpose for the people in Bayelsa. Staplet Energy PLC, one of Nigeria's leading indigenous energy companies, says it will continue to fund, mentor and provide skills for Nigerian entrepreneurs to help them contribute their quota to national development. The Director, External Affairs and Sustainability at Saplet Energy PLC, Dr. Chioman Wachuku, explains that its youth entrepreneurship interventions focuses on how to reduce poverty and provide income, and it remains impactful to beneficiaries. According to her, over 50 million naira has so far been released to 50 beneficiaries of the scheme. Young men and women from the streets. Young entrepreneurs who are making strides in their businesses rob minded officials of Seplat Energy PLC on how to further boost their businesses through the Seplat Global Entrepreneurship Fellowship Program delivered in collaboration with her partner NGO, Conversations for Change. Conversations for Change. The program targets leadership skills development, social entrepreneurship and business management abilities in the youth through generalized and targeted capacity building workshops. Each beneficiary, which all of you are here, you have shown great resilience, you have shown creativity, you have shown innovation through the duration of your program and have also become proofs of our concept that this is the way to go. The Corporate Social Responsibility Program of Separate Energy PLC, which has been running for 11 years, is hinged on the pillars of health, education, infrastructural development, and economic empowerment. All these interventions are aligned with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. I believe that with our partnership for C4C, we speak to SDG 8, we have been able to um, improve the lives of young entrepreneurs. I want to believe that have 
great impact on the economy of the country. And we count on you to sustain this and remain agents for change. The meeting also features a lecture on youth entrepreneurship and the presentation of 16.5 million naira to 23 budding small and medium enterprises. While the guest lecturer, Mrs. Iruma Ote, shares her thoughts on how young entrepreneurs can grow their businesses, an official of Separate Energy PLC speaks on the sustainability of the program. Entrepreneurs uh, need to be courageous, but need to be uh, those who can execute their ideas. Uh, they need to be able to manage their finances. They need to be able to manage the production, the operations, the marketing. Uh, so an entrepreneur really needs to gather the skills that they need uh, to be able to move their businesses forward. As long as the company survives, it will continue to sustain this type of businesses because it helps people to grow and it improves employment. And that's what exactly you are trying to work on. So definitely you are going to work on it to ensure that we support them. These interventions and many others by separate energy PLC cut across various sectors in the society in the bid to enhance socio-economic development in the country. Let's go over to Anne Waldo for some business news. Thank you, Millicent. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin with Nigeria's foreign direct investment. It has plunged by the third of the, of the percent, and that's last year, as the severe dollar shortage deterred companies from expanding. Latest data coming from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that investment fell to about $468 million in 2022, coming from $698 million one year earlier, falling further from a high of $4.7 billion recorded in 2008. Meanwhile, total capital importation into the country in the fourth quarter of last year dropped by 51.5% to about $1 billion. That's lower than $2.1 billion seen in 2021. Some industry players believe the country's perpetual lack of structural reforms means deep pockets foreign investors are now pressing pause on Nigeria's huge potential and its abundant natural resources. The president of the Association of Bureau de Change Operators in Nigeria, Mr. Mino Gudabe, says his association is looking forward to a legislation from the incoming administration that it will highlight and enhance the contribution of the sector to the economy. Mr. Gudabe spoke with journalists on the sidelines of an event organized by the Intergovernmental Action Group against money laundering in West Africa. And the equities market today sustained negative sentiments. The All Share Index dipped further by 0.27%. Laddie Williams has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report, where it looks like the bear is not giving the bull a breather in the first trading week of April. And we see it's, it's been three consecutive uh, days of losses there. See the All-Share Index down 0.19% with 4,082 points. Market cap still below that 30 trillion level, 29.462 um, trillion. Let's uh, look at the activity chart. We see volume there, 291 million units of stocks. Uh, much less than what we had yesterday. Value 2.95 uh, billion narrow deals, 4,485 was uh, getting to that 5,000 level. Let's look at the Guinness counter now. Uh, we see SCAR, Nigeria PLC, uh, leading that counter up uh, 10%. So that's a conglomerate and in, infrastructure development technology company there. It's leading the counter. Uh, Nigeria Aviation Handling Company also um, coming in second there, 9.55%. Up. Let's look at the uh, losers counter. We see Multiverse is top of the counter there. Two Naira, 92 cobalt close. And Eterna, that's an oil and gas, at uh, five Naira, 60 cobalt um, to close. So it looks like the bears are in control this week as profit taking uh, continues in the market. And that's a stock market report. I'm Ladi Williams. It's back to you. And that's business news for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Millicent. Thank you, Anne. And former U.S. President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 felony criminal charges during a court hearing in New York. 
The former U.S. president was accused of falsifying records to conceal crimes in the almost hour-long hearing. Prosecutors allege that Mr. Trump was a part of an illegal conspiracy to undermine the integrity of the 2016 election and was part of an unlawful plan to suppress negative information. Mr. Trump denies all wrongdoing and his lawyers have said they will fight to get the charges dropped. The former president has vowed to continue his 2024 bid and is expected to fly back to Florida after the arraignment. Well, for more international news, here's Simon Pusey with Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The Finnish flag has been raised at NATO headquarters in Brussels to mark Russia's western neighbour becoming the 31st member of the Western Alliance. I can actually then uh, hand over to you, uh, Minister Harvest there. Uh, the formal invitation uh, on behalf of all uh, allies. Finnish President uh, Sauli Ninistro and the U.S. Secretary of State joined NATO members for the joining ceremony. Finland's border with Russia, seen here at Valima, is part of an 832-mile eastern frontier with Russia. It means, with it joining, NATO's border with Russia has doubled in size. It is a setback for Russia's Vladimir Putin, who repeatedly complained of NATO's expansion ahead of his full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we can now declare that Finland is the 31st member of the North Atlantic Treaty. It is a big day for Finland, of course. And I'd say it's a win-win situation. It's good for NATO also. But... Uh, our next goal is, of course, to get our good neighbour Sweden to the full membership. A direct result of Vladimir Putin's aggression and his illegal invasion of Ukraine, the day where a new ally joins our defensive alliance. I think that is uh, very positive. Uh, we will celebrate that today and then very quickly get to work on the accession of uh, Sweden. At least one person has been killed and around 30 injured, some seriously, after a passenger train derailed in the Western Netherlands. Drone video shows the extent of the crash site from the air. Emergency services say the overnight crash happened after the train transporting about 50 people hit a construction crane near the village of Voorschotten. A freight train is also reported to have been damaged. Some people were treated at the scene, but 19 have been taken to hospital. At least six people have been killed after an avalanche struck the northeastern Indian state of Sikkim. Officials said all six fatalities were tourists and at least 30 people were injured in the avalanche that took place in the Nathula mountain pass. Rescue operations are reportedly still underway in the area. Authorities have been working to extinguish a huge fire that raged through a shopping complex with 3,000 shops in Bangladesh's capital of Dakar. No casualties have been reported so far in the fire, which began in the early hours of Tuesday morning, but army personnel had been called in to help after flames spread rapidly in the cramped, crowded area, home to the country's famed cloth markets. Here the scene from above, aerial footage showing how the fire had destroyed everything in its path. Fire service officials said 55 units were working to douse the flames, the cause of which was not known immediately. The government of South Sudan has dispatched an additional 300 soldiers to the neighbouring Democratic Republic of Congo under the banner of the regional bloc. They will be part of the East African Regional Force fighting the M23 rebel group. It brings the total number of South Sudan troops in the country to over a thousand, that's according to the Defence Minister. The 300 soldiers will be deployed to Goma, the headquarters of the regional force. They will be replaced after a year. NASA has named the first woman and the first African-American ever assigned as astronauts to a lunar mission, introducing them as part of the four-member team. It is an honor to be here. Christina Koch is an engineer who already holds the record for longest continuous spaceflight by a woman and was part of NASA's first three all-female spacewalks. She will be joined by Victor Glover, a U.S. Navy aviator and veteran of four spacewalks, who will be the first black astronaut ever to be sent on a lunar mission. It is the first crewed voyage around the moon in more than 50 years. 
And two extremely rare, critically endangered Sumatran tiger cubs have been born at a zoo in Chester in the United Kingdom. Hidden cameras, which the cubs were initially a bit suspicious of, captured a glimpse of them both. Just 350 Sumatran tigers are thought to remain in the wild, making them one of the world's rarest tiger subspecies on the planet. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. Now, Chelsea were once again let down by their wasteful finishing in their first game since Graham Potter's sacking as Liverpool hung on to a goalless draw at Stamford Bridge this evening. Chelsea remain 11th, leaving them with an uncertain future despite the massive investment new signings made by Chelsea owner Todd Bowley since he took over last year. Brighton continued their march towards European qualification with a 2-0 win at Bournemouth. Leeds United boosted their survival hopes with a priceless 2-1 victory over Nottingham Forest, whose dismal away form had continued at Ellen Road. A late strike from Bertrand Traore saw Aston Villa to a dramatic 2-1 win against managerless Leicester, who were now two points from Premier League safety. And former world number one Tiger Woods admits that this year's Masters tournament is extra special to him as he is not sure how many more he will play again. The 15-time major winner is making his 25th appearance at Augusta National this week, 12 months on from his miracle return following his horror single cat crash that almost cost him his right leg. And that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Victor Mathias. Thank you for watching. It's back to Medicine with the wrap of the news at 10. Thank you, Victor. And the main news again. Members of the House of Representatives today condemned plots to install interim national government. The lawmakers who gave their position today following an observation by one of them are asking security agencies to be on alert. Also today, the Labour Party presidential candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, said he has never discussed or encouraged anyone to undermine the Nigerian state. He was reacting to allegations of treason allegedly levelled against him by the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed. And former U.S. President Donald Trump today pleaded not guilty to 34 felony criminal charges during a court hearing in New York. He has since flown back to Florida. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.